First of all, it was great to have some laughs, as you could tell by the, the chat thread. I'm just, you know, hopelessly goofy. Um, I even have a, a dad joke book on my desk. It is with me all the time in case I need to reference it during meetings, um, just in case. And so that's, that is who I am. Um, so I appreciate coming in and, and having a few laughs with all of you. So thank you for that. Uh, but beyond that, welcome and thank you for having me. Um, it's not my first uh, foray with men search, not MN search as I've been calling it. Uh, I did speak at the summit back in 2016, early 2016. Um, and so excited to be back with all of you folks uh, in a virtual format. Uh, but let's get to introductions. So who am I? Hi, I'm John Lee, uh, the head of evangelism at Microsoft Advertising. And I've been with Microsoft now uh, around four and a half years. But bigger picture, I've been in the digital advertising industry now for 15 years, which is frightening. I'm getting old. Um, and so I'm here today with you uh, to talk through this idea of marketing with purpose and how marketing with purpose can drive growth through trusted brand experiences. So we, Microsoft Advertising, have been on a journey for the last few years, one rooted in deliberate curiosity in the hopes that it might help our clients and deliver on our mission here at Microsoft. So the work we've done is it was started well before the unparalleled demands of 2020 kicked in. And we've been supporting our clients and agency partners on their journey towards more inclusive marketing as well. There's been a clear need to shift uh, to, to focus on people, their values, to find our common human values and double down on figuring out how we can help you, our clients represent all of that in your marketing and in the fabric of your business and building an incredible relationship with your customers. We set our sights on digging really deep and producing new knowledge sets and new data sets that we can all use, including additional customer research studies on how brands are building trust, the role of inclusion in advertising, if it had one at all, uh, and how all of that is going to impact brand and advertising performance. So before we get into today's content, I would like to say something personal and important and just putting it all out there, right? Some of you may be wondering what a guy like me is doing talking about such deep topics like diversity and inclusion and inclusive marketing. I want to acknowledge my privilege, right? I am a white middle-aged male, all of that is true. And I'm here today to talk through these topics humbly and without pretension. I care deeply and my hope is that all of you see that, you hear that, as I discuss these topics and you'll come along on the journey with me today. So with that, we will jump in. So I think we can all agree, uh, the past year has been the toughest we've seen in many of our lifetimes and 2021 doesn't seem to be letting up just yet, though hope is on the horizon, right? I, I myself have already had the first of two uh, shots. Um, I actually have my sticker here on my desk with me, right? So sticker <laughs> badge carrying member, right? Um, what we discovered though uh, on this journey um, is that we've had to step up and, and help our clients recover, respond and reimagining their advertising and their business in a time when there's just unprecedented economic uncertainty, health and safety concerns, all of this, in addition to a keen awareness of inequality and social injustice. So the demand for how brands need to show up for people is getting clearer and what people expect from brands is getting bolder. We at Microsoft Advertising are grateful for our close partnerships with advertisers and agencies and for the research and work that we've done over the past couple of years. And so I'm very excited because this has led us to this moment where we can you know, spend 40, 45 minutes together and overview this information with the helps that you can take it and start to integrate it into your work and help you and your teams, as well as your clients, navigate these times and future times with success. The PowerPoint's not playing nice. There we go. So there's one guiding principle we use, and this is where everything that I'm going to talk about tonight begins, and that's purpose. So we found in our research that companies that lead with purpose are more trusted and loved 
It's a key word, love. It helps them endure and thrive through tough times because it inspires loyal connections with their employees, their communities, and their customers. Purpose fuels a genuine human connection through shared meaning. It allows all of us, whether we have our business or personal hat on, to respond under pressure and in uncertain times with focus, clarity, and authenticity. Whether that is changing your supply chain to become a customer of a more socially conscious supplier or working on the creative you designed for your advertising, having a clear brand purpose leads to authenticity by design. And authenticity is the number one brand attribute that leads to trust. So clear brand purpose leads to authentic, trusted brand experiences. All right, so I ask you, don't wait, <laughs> get energized around this. We, all of us, all of you need to find your brand purpose, know it, re-examine it. Is it as true today as when it was originally written? The definition of purpose is the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. What is your company's purpose? Does it align with what people care about inside your organization and out? Because the world is in an inflection point. It's time for us to get to the very core purpose of a modern corporation and what it means for the world going forward. That's what our world demands of us. Some pretty wise words from Mr. Nadella there. And so to level set with all of you, our mission at Microsoft, our purpose is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And that is why I'm sharing a window into some of our research with you today. And that's the very reason We've gone down this path at Microsoft Advertising to research and uncover marketing with purpose. So our research shows values drive value. <laughs> I'll say that again, values drive value. What someone values, not just who they are, based on generic demographics is where shared meaning between a person and a brand can begin to co-author together. A trusting relationship that leads to incredible loyalty First, make your brand values clear. What is your mission on this planet? It really starts there. It seems lofty, but it's relatively simple. What is your benevolent brand attributes, your promises, and how do they relate to your product truth? Consider your sustainable business practices, your accessible customer experiences, your inclusive initiatives to bring more equitable customer experiences. Because how you do business is also your marketing. Expressing your brand values at every level is what it will take to build a trusted connection with people and what they value. That will drive growth. To uncover people's values and identify where you align, you must go deep into understanding diversity. There are many dimensions of what makes us unique. Diversity goes beyond what we can see in appearance like race or gender. Do you know what your customer believes in? Are you considering people with disabilities? Are you going beyond the usual dimensions of disability and perhaps considering neural diversity? Do you know your customer's cultural influences like language, education, location, nationality? And what are your organizational influences? Where do they work? What is their position, their tenure, their job function? There's an opportunity for a richer conversation. And that's all I'm trying to say. Going beyond the obvious dimensions of diversity gives you more opportunities to connect authentically with people and be relevant and resonate. Now, next is where I'm going to try and play a video. And if somebody could please alert me <laughs> if they can't hear this as soon as it starts to play. So got you. I got you, John. All right. All right. So this is a short clip um, from our um, video show called The Download. If you've not watched it yet, I do highly recommend it. Um, but in this instance, this is an interview with uh, someone from the marketing team at Crocs. So without further ado. You're watching The Download. We're speaking okay. with Heidi Cooley, head of global marketing at Crocs. Thanks for joining okay. us today. Yes, so thanks sure so much for can. having me. Tell me about Crocs. Crocs makes the shoe that is the ultimate form of self-expression. Many consumers recognize our iconic classic clog around the world. Who is the Crocs customer? First and foremost, we call ourselves a very delightfully democratic brand. We have shoes for everyone. Um, that being said, our target consumer is the female millennial, partly because her attributes align to ours. She's fun and she's brave. She's comfortable in her own shoes and she's unapologetically optimistic. How did Crocs respond to COVID? We too closed retail stores all over the world at the onset of the pandemic. 
Uh, but the way Crocs responded was different than a lot of footwear companies. So first and foremost, our strategy is rooted in what we call a consumer first approach. We are a brand that every single day listens to our fans. Whether they're asking for white classics for graduation to prom shoes, um, we respond to fans one-on-one -on -one every day. And at the onset of COVID, fans started reaching out. They were healthcare heroes, they were their family and their friends, and they were telling us that they needed the functional benefits of Crocs. They needed footwear that was easy to clean, easy to put on and off, comfortable. And when fans started reaching out, we knew we were a brand that had to respond. How has your marketing been impacted? Yeah, sure, like every brand, we made incredible adjustments real time. Uh, programs were cut, programs were pushed, uh, programs were moved to next year. That being said, the most important campaign we've probably ever initiated to date was our campaign called Free Pair for Healthcare. And that was our response to consumers needing our shoes. So within five days of healthcare heroes around the world asking for Crocs, a global team initiated a commitment around giving tens of thousands of pairs a day to healthcare heroes. And we gave away over 45 days, 860,000 pairs of Crocs valued at over $40 million. So Heidi, the CMO, uh, goes on to say that their brand momentum has never been stronger around the world. We're seeing positive trends from an e-commerce performance perspective and are building an incredible goodwill with fans that believe in their vision as a company. It's just one of, of many examples. So from our research, 85% of consumers say they'll only consider a brand if they trust a brand. So it's critical, critical in starting, maintaining, and building a relationship with a consumer. Yes, sure, there are varying degrees of trust. Don't get me wrong. People still do business with companies they may not necessarily trust 100%. Think companies that dominate a market or provide convenience or savings and for whom there's limited direct competition. People will sometimes make that trade-off, but once they're given an alternative, they flee. So I'm going to share a graph, which is the result of our studies on inclusion and trust. We call it the loyalty curve, where the three core building blocks of trust were discovered, surfaced by the data, and where we could see that brand trust and brand love are highly linked. As trust in a brand increases, so does people's expression of love for the brand. I'll emphasize that, love for the brand. The higher the trust rating, the higher respondents gushed over those brands. Our findings uncovered the necessary actions you see here that marketers can take to increase trust, create brand love, and develop customer loyalty. These are the top brand attributes and actions you can take that build growth through trusted customer experiences. And these attributes come directly from our research and indexed very high against the three areas of trust, love, and loyalty. And the key is demonstrating responsibility, values, and inclusion. And this is where we start to get to the thick of things. And so our marketing with purpose framework is built on this concentric, right? This Venn diagram of values, inclusion, and responsibility. And we have put together a full, a full playbook. And so I'm going to touch on a lot of topics. I'm going to reference the research and certain findings. This is something that interests you. And I certainly hope that it does. There's a full ebook, uh, completely for free. We're not even gonna ask for your email. Uh, it is there for you to take and read and, and go do good deeds with. Uh, the link is there on this screen. It's also gonna be at the end of the presentation. I, I, like I said, I urge you to go and take a look because I'm gonna give you the tip of the iceberg here this evening. Um, but that ebook is deep. There's a lot there in terms of the data, but also direct action items like how to's and walkthroughs. So good, good, good resource. So. Marketing with purpose, <laughs> big concept, responsibility, value, and inclusion. So let's dig in. So marketing with purpose is the difference between earning a customer for a day and gaining a customer for life. So that idea of loyalty, brand love. Let's touch on these three building blocks and we'll start with responsibility. And it comes first, trust isn't static. And businesses have to put long-term strategies in place to maintain trust and inspire customer advocacy. People want the truth. They want to trust your brand. 
They want to be respected with their privacy and your transparency as well as accessibility. That's a lot, I know. People want equitable experiences too, not just compliance that may or may not get you there. They want incredible experiences with your brands, powerful moments. Focusing on accessibility is responsible marketing and responsible business. But further, it opens up new opportunities to be fair and equitable to all customers. It grows your customer base. So build trusted brand experiences around privacy and transparency. Ensure you base all of your actions on responsible business practices, like knowing what ad platforms you're running your ads on and that they have great brand safety measures in place. Responsibility is about doing the right thing, not just what is legally required of you. It's about going above and beyond that. And if you do it, creating growth through trusted brand experiences. Now, what's the risk of not paying attention to this if you don't take this seriously? Unless you have guardrails in place to protect trust and act responsibly as a brand, once you lose trust, it is very, very hard to recover. So just want to let that sink in, right? Think of some of these practices as guardrails, right? To make sure that, hey, you know, None of us are perfect. No brand is perfect. No individual is perfect. We may make mistakes, but as long as we're working, doing our best to build equity of trust, right? There's going to be some forgiveness there, right? So trust is gained in drops, but it is lost in buckets, right? Gained in drops, but lost in buckets. That's the risk of not paying attention. 63% of those in our survey have stopped purchasing from a brand because they lost trust. And 69% of them would never purchase from the brand again. And as we showed in our loyalty curve earlier, it means doing the right thing, being honest with what you're advertising and being true to your brand purpose, looking for those shared values and delivering on those product truths. Now let's talk accessibility. Don't tune out, this is important. <laughs> but why is accessibility important? Equitable access. Accessible marketing is responsible marketing, creating trusted customer experiences. You've heard me say that before. I will say it again, but you guessed it. It drives growth. What business doesn't want to serve more people, period. That is what digital accessibility is about because over a billion people live with disabilities in the world, according to the UN and World Health Organization. And when you add up their friends and family that are often involved in their lives directly, that is about 2.3 billion people. And the spending power goes from 3.2 trillion annually to 6.9 trillion. Yes, that's trillion with a T. To add to this case for paying attention to building more trusted customer experiences, consider the persona spectrum, a framework taken from inclusive, des inclusive design principles. Let me walk you through this. So it's based on the idea that there are people who are living with permanent disabilities, like someone who was born without or lost an appendage. There are people who are living with temporary impairment, like someone who had rotator cuff surgery and situational impairment. Think about new parents who, if they're holding their baby, they only have one usable hand. So I did a little researching about these numbers and these numbers are from the US, but the concept applies everywhere. There are 26,000 people who lose an appendage or are born without one each year, but there are 13 million people who experience an inner injury to an appendage. And there are 8 million people in the US who have a baby each year, which removes your ability to use one arm. So when you add all of these numbers up, it's 21 million people who can be reached when a solution designed for permanent disability might actually help in all of these situations. You build one that extends to many. That's pretty incredible, right? So let's highlight another form of marketing with purpose, and that is expressed in the very product itself, inclusive product design. Tommy Hilfiger, who launched Tommy Hilfiger Adaptive in 2017, including magnetic buttons, padded seats and pants for those who sit for long periods of time, such as those in wheelchairs, zippers you can easily do with one hand, Velcro closures, and in speaking directly with Tommy Hilfiger's team that led this incredible retail innovation, they told us that 80% of customers who purchased both an adaptive and non-adaptive item in the same purchase were new to the brand. <laughs> and when they looked at the consumers who purchased adaptive only during the same time period, the percentage of new customers was even higher. And this stat is from their Tommy.com consumer insights data from their first two years of adaptive, which was October, 2017 to October, 2019. That's two years worth of data being seen, understood and served 
drives growth. And you can find that by applying a human-centric, inclusive lens to your business. Where did this incredible, innovative idea come from? Their purpose, their mission statement. Make it possible. That's powerful, right? Make it possible. Marketing with purpose drives growth through trusted brand experiences. 80% new customers is unreal. Being seen, understood, and served truly drives growth. Hopefully the wheels are starting to turn now, right? What is your brand purpose? Who are you missing out on serving as customers? I'm, honestly, I'm excited for you to seize the possibilities. So let's talk about the role of values because finding shared values creates growth as well through trusted brand experiences. Values drive value, right? I've said that before, values drive value. That phrase means that you are ensuring that you understand the values of the people you strive to serve and that you're clear on your own brand values. Shift your company from being product centric to people centric, and that's going to drive product innovation as well as ad innovation. You know, ensure you go deep into diversity to uncover what is at the core of your customer's values. But first you must know your brand values to find them, to find commonality at all, right? And that's just simply being authentic, which again, it's going to help you create growth through more trusted brand experiences. So let's go a couple clicks deeper. So from the, from the very first study, the initial study we did with Marketing with Purpose a couple of years ago, we found that people will buy from brands that stand for something larger than just their products when it aligns to their own values. These stats are huge. 80% of people believe, believe brands should play a role in solving societal problems. 60% of millennials and Gen Z prefer a brand that supports a social cause. And 92% of people say they have a more positive image of a company that supports a social or societal issue. 88% of people want brands to step up on sustainable lifestyles and help them improve their environmental and social footprint in daily life. It's a big number. The flip side to this is when we asked participants in our study what, what it was they actually did as it related to purchasing from brands. Well, they stopped purchasing from a brand because it did not represent my values. And when you couple that with 80% that want brands to solve society's problems, along with the rest of the data, you can see how values drive value. And being a wallflower as a brand is simply not going to cut it. Playing it safe is far riskier than taking a stand. So I want to go back a couple steps. I want to go back to the Microsoft's purpose and our mission, right? So empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. The key to this statement is every person. Right, organizations, yes, Microsoft, everyone knows Microsoft this is you know big business to business brand, but we're far more than that. And at the end of the day, businesses are people. They're run by people, right? So the key is every person. This challenged us as a company to ask the question, are we truly empowering every person? This led to our cultural shift of striving to be ever more inclusive and to focus on the 1 billion people with disabilities and the incredible opportunity to ensure we develop for them. Of course, inclusion means all people, but we did begin with looking at the opportunity to include those who often are excluded from participating in the same way a majority of us do. The fundamental shift in our transformation was going from, the, from an inside out view, focusing on our products to an outside in view, focusing on people, all people and everything that makes them unique, including values. So let's share a tangible example here for a more trusted brand experience with an accessible product experience. It is our responsibility as business leaders and marketers to seek out how we might be excluding others and solve that. And this will lead to trust. The Xbox adaptive controller is one of those ideas born from our purpose. Inclusive product design at its best. And if you've not seen the Xbox adaptive controller, I highly recommend you go to Bing Yes, I said that. Go to Bing and search Xbox Adaptive Controller. The thing is amazing. Uh, it truly is. There's a lot of really cool videos showing how, how folks are using it. Definitely look that one up. But the Xbox team went a step further. Have you ever experienced accessible packaging? Have you ever experienced complete frustration when trying to open product packaging? Yeah, me too. Clamshell packaging is the worst, right? <laughs> now I'm going to play a quick uh, one minute clip of a gamer who's known as no hands, no excuses. And let's be honest, he describes this way better than I ever could. 
is use my knife to cut one piece of tape and the box just opened. I have I get packages all the time. Okay, not all the time, but I get a lot of packages and nobody has ever sent me anything. S Nobody has ever sent me anything except Xbox when they sent me the Xbox adaptive controller a while back that made me think they thought of me when they designed the bloody box it was wrapped up in. That is how amazingly inclusive I feel that Xbox has been with everything that they have done to make this console, to make gaming literally for everybody. So I'm going to be honest. I, I can't actually hear the video on my end. So desperately hoping you all can. But uh, I reviewed this video earlier, earlier today in preparation for this evening. I've seen that video easily a dozen times, maybe more. But I don't, I don't know what was going on in my head at the time. But I watched that and I teared up a little bit, right? Like I am an able-bodied human being. I love playing video games. I myself have purchased the, the new Xbox Series X and just hearing his experience, just, I was overwhelmed, right? Um, with, with empathy and to be honest, happiness in the happiness that he found in that experience. And so hopefully some of you found, um, found much the same. So this quote I think is, is a powerful one. You know, we're designing a diversity of things. So everyone finds a way to participate and they find a sense of belonging. So, I mean, honestly, like, how do you think this experience has affected his trust and loyalty? And, you know, by the way, according to the Edelman Trust Barometer, loyalty is the number one indicator of future revenue growth. All right, so finally, the role of inclusion. People want inclusion, not just to be included. That's a, I'll, I'll say that one again, let, let that one sink in. People want inclusion not just to be included. So the act of inclusion is ensuring you build a trusted brand experience end to end that properly reflects people, their values in a genuine and authentic way that serves their needs and that drives growth. It's not just doing multicultural marketing. It goes much, much deeper. You need to think about what you market, who you market to and how you market with an inclusive lens. So again, we're going to go, go deep here and then we'll, we'll round things out with some action items. But the, this section, I think more than the rest is where, particularly in the search space, whether that's SEO, maybe you're working on content, working on paid, this is where some of the biggest lessons for us will come to play. So we can, uh, con conducted a study on the psychology of inclusion and the effects in advertising. And again, the results of that were very, very eye-opening. So our research uncovered that brands representing diversity in their ads are more authentic and therefore more trustworthy, no matter what gender or ethnicity we surveyed. So more authentic, more trust trustworthy, right? Across the board. The results of our research showed that is genuine and authentic is the top attribute in building trust, brand love and loyalty with people. And 72% of the respondents in our survey stated that they're more likely to support brands that are authentic in their advertising. So trust improves brand and advertising performance, period. But achieving that status, ensuring people feel seen, heard, and understood so that you come across as genuine and authentic is where purpose is critical, right? So all of the steps leading up to this. Um, and so it all, it all works together. Inclusive advertising done authentically feels like connection and family. It produces the feelings of joy and trust. Our research shows us that there are two main underlying feelings that inclusive advertising produces in people. And those are simply joy and trust. But there are many feelings that make up joy and trust. So let's take a look. So these are the feelings of inclusion, not just being included. These are so useful to understand how your brand, your products can play a role in delivering inclusion. Seek to uncover your product truths that make good on these feelings. And there you can unlock another way to build a trusted brand experience. Joy and trust, right? And acceptance, clarity, confidence, relief are right at that intersection. 
I'm going to come back to words. We're going to, we're going to talk a little bit more about words. So keep that in your mind. So our research also uncovered that inclusion in advertising drives purchase intent, right? This is where rubber meets road for advertisers and marketers. For this research, we studied Tommy Hilfiger again because they do a great job of displaying various elements of diversity. And they also have many ads that would not be considered inclusive. Still great, appealing, and still driving purchase intent. But a great selection for us, nonetheless, for the purposes of a study. We asked Gen Z respondents to tell us which were most appealing and which were most inclusive. And we mapped that to purchase intent. When we broke down the performance, the most inclusive ad shown here earned a 23 point lift in purchase intent. People said that it made the brand feel more genuine and authentic. That's big. We also saw in the most, um, in that most inclusive ad that no matter what gender or eth ethnicity, there was an increase in purchase intent after seeing that inclusive ad. I want to note that although the image featured every person in the ad with a disability, that only 10% of those surveyed identified as having one themselves. So I invite you to consider that it inclusively advertising is not only connecting with those represented in the ad, but it also is connecting with those who share the value of diversity and inclusion. So again, a lift across the board regardless of whether they had a matching disability identified. So lastly, but definitely not least, words matter and so do images. So based on remarkable insights to how people perceive inclusion, we discovered ways to signal inclusion using three metaphors, connection, openness, and balance. The first is the idea of connection or family. Consider the following words as language-based cues in your ad copy your content that indicates inclusion by building a sense of connection, diversity, involvement, coming together, family, cohesive, understood, bonded, belonging. These are big, powerful words, all about connection. Openness or open-mindedness. In this metaphor, when a brand can come across as open, this indicates a sense of inclusion. This is the sense that the brand will push boundaries, is open-minded and exploratory. They do not hold back. So think friendly, warm, versatile, included, free, expanding, safe, secure. And then finally, balance, which is about ensuring that everyone is represented equally, that no one person stands out as more important than anyone else. So if you can find ways to incorporate any of these 50 words authentically aligned with what you are marketing and consider how your product, service, or experience can build connections, again, be open or you know, open-minded, anything that strives for balance, you're going to see that pay off in spades. But it works with images as well. So signaling inclusion within images. So it's the same three metaphors, but in, with images, we look at it a little bit differently. You know, it's one thing just to include diverse individuals, but you know, if you want to really create that sense of feeling of included, we've got to go a little bit deep, deeper. It's a little more subtle. So someone might be able to, to see someone like themselves in the imagery, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to feel connected. That sense of connection is often triggered by the models in the imagery, either by close proximity or touching or establishing a relationship visually of some kind, like engaging in some way that feels like they are friends or family, cultural accuracy, diverse representation that is authentic. So, so deep. So connection in, in images is created by a visible relationship or an interaction between people. It's positive. It's realistic diversity. Openness is expressed by including differently abled people, including larger bodies, including multiple people of color. And balance is everyone is featured with the same prominence, multiple dimensions of diversity represented. So a lot of concepts, big lofty goals. How do we think about putting purpose into action? So hopefully I can give you um, some leads here, some, some tips to go and take this, uh, take this to your daily work. I, I don't expect you to do that tonight. <laughs> I know most of you are on central time. So what that puts you at, at seven o'clock. Don't, don't, don't worry about this tonight, but tomorrow morning, right? When you get back to your desk at your home, or if you're back in your office, start to think about how can you bring these to discussions with your teams, with your managers? How can you think about putting it into your own work? And again, Regardless, if you're somebody just working on the back end of a website, accessibility, 
SEO, which is accessibility content, or you're just the content person, or my peeps, right? Search marketing, SEM and PPC, or if you're working in native and display advertising, social, you get the picture, right? There's a lot of ground to cover and all of these topics apply regardless of which piece of the ecosystem you're working in. So we'll start with accessibility, right? Accessible marketing is responsible marketing. <laughs> reiterating in that phrase. And I'll bring up this idea of the persona spectrum again. I think that's a really useful example. Um, and again, with that, with that example of, you know, someone who's lost an appendage or someone who's temporarily damaged, injured, sorry, an appendage, or that example of a situational where it's a new parent holding a baby, they really only have one meaningful hand open. If you make something accessible to a one-handed individual, you've actually made things accessible for all three of these groups. That's huge. Think about that and how that can apply in a multitude of examples. But if you really need to think through, okay, what do I need to do? Um, whether you have an existing website or better yet, uh, um, if you're working on building a what you're like leading up to building a new website, what I would say is I have gone through the process in my time at Microsoft of launching a site where certain elements of accessibility were checked off the list at lunch, but within, within Microsoft, we were given new rules. And this is where as Microsoft, we were told here, here is the baseline. This is what the government, this is what the law says we need to do for accessibility. Here's what we're going to do. And it is really, it is really challenging to take a site that's already launched, that's already live, has daily users and go in and retroactively make these changes. I've been there, I've done that, it's, it's, it is tough. So. If you're, if you're in a unique position, we could do it at the, at the onset. That's awesome. Um, so a couple of resources, there's the Fluent Design System. And this is gonna give you all sorts of useful tips just in terms of efficient design, uh, but also heavily, heavily reinforced in this is accessibility. And that's gonna be for the web, Windows apps, Android and or iOS. There's also the accessibility insights. And again, you can just do a quick search on either of these. These sites will be the first result that comes up, I promise, on Bing, <laughs> wink, wink. Um, but again, good places to start. And what I would say is take a look at these resources and say, okay, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna audit my website content. I'm gonna audit my SEO content or activity. But take a look at my, my, my paid search landing pages, consider those accessibility needs and consider what changes you can put, put in place sooner than later. This idea of data bias and you know, thinking beyond what and who you know, and, and something that we've been talking about a lot internally, just with my specific team, uh, not all of Microsoft advertising, but my specific team is this idea of challenging assumptions. If you can challenge an assumption, you can make a conversation start about, okay, I hear you and have you considered this? So let's start with an example of men make car purchase decisions. Maybe a little, you know, old school, right? However, how males and females arrive at a car purchase decision differs vastly. And as this example you can see here in the screenshot shows, what is being searched by the various genders is, is largely the same. The order in which they may happen is different, but what they're searching is the same, but they're ultimately getting to the same endpoint. But my point actually is this, is that we have data, and this is in, in the ebook, um, that SUVs, one of the most popular segments of vehicles today, do you know who makes the most purchase decisions? Females not males. Now, another example, only women buy luxury handbags. Challenge that assumption. It could be a boyfriend shopping for a gift. It could be a non-binary gender expressing individual buying for a partner. So are you set up to prevent data bias? Are your assumptions limiting your growth? That could be in your keyword research, how you think through audience targeting, what you're doing with demographic bidding. So take a look at gender, take a look at age, sexual orientation, geography, all of this. Understand your customers and more specifically how your campaigns include or exclude them. And then there's this idea of shared values. 
and generational values and attitudes across generations and how they can vary very so wide, widely, right? Now there can be overlap across generations, um, but then priority order changes drastically. And values are so important because they are true to our core being. And because of that, they drive behaviors from privacy decisions to purchase intent and significantly more. And one that I, I, I always, it just strikes me every time I see, see these tables is that the, this middle row here. And if you look at Gen X boomers and pre-boomers, those are largely the same value statements just in different order. Think family or working hard, honesty, just a matter of where they came in in terms of a priority stack. But then you look at Gen Z and millennials and it's completely different. <laughs> Ambition, knowledge, curiosity, creativity. And I am not dinging Gen Z or millennials. I am technically a millennial myself. I am at the very old, like gray haired level of millennial status, but I am one. And when I see this, I'm like, well, that's not really true. I, I hold family as a value, working hard, relationships, authenticity. However, it's a matter of priority stacking, right? It's not to say they don't have those values, it's just where they put them in order of, of, of importance. So think through generational values and where that falls with your audience. And as we take this idea of these shared values a step further, the work ahead for all of us is to consider the values of your, con your consumers, as well as the values of your brand. And once you've landed on those, ensuring that they show up on your websites, in your messaging, within your keywords even. So are they reflected on your website, your landing pages, and your ads? And so that's this top example is Give with Bing. And if you think of, think Microsoft, you know, philanthropy is a big deal. Um, for the brand and, and how that passes through to us as employees. And we're urged to, to give back in time and money wherever possible. And our customers agree. Our partners agree, right? And want to participate in things with us. And Give With Bing is a tremendous example where something as simple as doing a search can actually turn into a donation to a charity. Big deal, right? But bringing those values to bear on the website and in the product itself. And then if you think about keyword strategy, both from a, an organic SEO perspective, but also from a paid search perspective, do your keywords align with brand and consumer values? So I'm a musician, uh, you know, I play guitar, I play piano, I sing, I, heck, I play harmonica too. Um, I'm, I'm in a band, <laughs> I love music, but all it is to say is that it's not uncommon for me to search guitars. And so you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a search to see what, what happens if I, if I try to look for a sustainable guitar, given they are largely made out of wood. And this example was, is real. I screen capped it as soon as I saw it. <laughs> so that, that first suggested result, you know, guitar maker, sustainable wood, okay. Good generic phrase, likely a lot of people are searching on, on that. But look at what comes in as that second suggested query. Sustainable wood Martin guitar. For anybody that knows guitars, Martin is a major brand. They have clearly done their homework. They have clearly optimized their site. They've optimized their content so that they show up for that query. And that is huge. And that right there is somebody, kudos to them, doing their work in matching their brand values to their customer values and making it click with their SEO strategy. So let's touch on the words again, right? And, and this is in this presentation twice because it's so important. And like, if there's something that you could, you know, cut out and maybe paste in your home cubicle, if that is such a thing, um, right? But whenever you get back to your office, pin it to your cubicle, right? So the, these three metaphors of connection, openness, and balance, this is a, a great reference to come back to and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit down and write some landing page copy. I'm going to sit down and write some ad copy. And I know that my audience cares so much about balance. It's gotta be balance. All right, here's a, just a pre-made list of words, right? Statistically shown to go within that category and work well. So, you know, again, do they care about balance? Talk about equality and understanding, right? Do they care about connection? Talk about care and community and use this as a simple, it truly is simple, a simple framework brainstorming and creating your own inclusive ideas. 
And that brings us to two different areas, just specifically in the paid search world, where this really starts to get some traction. So we'll start with DSA or dynamic search ads. DSA within the context, within the, the scope of inclusion is a great tool to uncover blind spots and potential audiences that are missing from your core search campaigns. So, you know, I look at it as a way to discover purpose themed keyword opportunities. You know, what words you got to start there. Like what words to find purpose for me and my brand. Now let's get to work, <laughs> right? So if you, you know, again, if you think responsibility, trusted, respected, compliant, or with values, you know, sustainable, eco-friendly, uh, inclusion, accessible, you know, LGBTQI, may, female, male, female, non-binary, et cetera, whatever the words are, start there. Take the data, the search query data that's com compiled from your DSA campaign and leverage an in-gram analysis. And if you've never done an Enneagram analysis, it's a little tricky, but there are some unique tools out there that, that'll work with Excel. Just do a quick Bing, Bing search on Enneagram analysis Excel. There's a lot of great instructions out there. But all this is to say is I can take one word, that's an Enneagram or an, a bigram, which would be two words, and run that against an entire stack of search queries. How often does this one word appear regardless of the query? And it's gonna throw back that data to you. So once you've understood your your purpose words, those engrams for purpose. Do the analysis. What queries are surfacing that you're not actually bidding on yet, right? They're, they're coming up in DSA. Awesome. That's cool. Clearly, my audience is onto something that I wasn't before. Let's get that into my, my core keyword based campaign. Awesome. But on the flip side, what queries are not surfacing, but they should be, right? For instance, let's say you've done the homework. You have your purpose, your purpose words, and you thought you had done a really good job of baking that into your content, your meta tags, all of that stuff that's on your landing pages and your website pages, but it's not surfacing. Well, all right, time to go back to the drawing board. Clearly I missed something. Um, take a look at that content, make a tweak, try, try, try again. And then RSA, so responsive search ads. The entire concept of RSA is R, right message at the right time, right? You get what, 15 slots for headlines, four slots for body copy. Hey Google, hey Bing, take all this stuff, throw it against the wall and let's make it work, right? Tell me, tell me what's working best. Cool, that's the core concept of RSA. Well, in this case, again, go back to the list and pardon my Google mini going off there, <laughs> um, go back to the list, right? And say, okay, hey, you know, it's whether it's connection, openness, balance, what are my words? Let's test different variations. Let's test a little, you know, maybe 15 to the 50, one for each headline slot of an RSA, couple within my four body copies. And let's just put this out into the world. I think this is what my audience wants to hear. Let's actually test it in the wild and see what happens. Let's see if it works. That is where RSA can really shine because it takes ad testing to the nth degree, right? And then use that asset performance data to say, okay, which combinations, which headlines, which body copies are actually driving performance forward and resonating, actually connecting with my audience and carry that forward, right? Onto the next test, onto the next RSA ad. And then we can't talk about any of this without referencing images. So inclusion and image choice. So my charge to all of you is to go back. Again, you get into work tomorrow, or maybe it's in the next week. Audit your image usage on your website, on your, your paid search landing pages, and any of your image-based campaigns, regardless of display, native, social. But not just you, not just your peers, not just your boss. I urge you to find a diverse set of people to work on this audit with you to ensure that they are genuine, unique and representative of your target audience, right? Avoid data bias by pulling in a diverse set of folks to do an audit with you. It's a great way to gut check, right? You're like, I think this is right. I think this is gonna work. I think I've done my homework. However, let's, let's make sure, right? I'm gonna make sure before I put this out into the world. So again, get those images reviewed by a diverse set of people. 
and just I've got to throw it in there, right? So you know, let's say that you're you're running uh, native ads on the Microsoft Audience Network, and you're like, hey, you know what? I I know I need a better image for this campaign to match the values of, of my my customers, my target audience. I just don't have them, or I don't have the resources to get them. Great plug here, product feature plug, right? Um, so we have a, a partnership with Shutterstock. It's huge. We actually have additional developments to come on this relationship in the coming weeks and months. But what you could do is simply type in a search to get a result back. And so in this case, copy non-binary photos, find the one you like, it's as simple as click, save, done and done. And I know I'm like two minutes over time. So to, to wrap up, I'm at my final slide. So walking away, five frameworks to think on this topic as you go forward. Remember that people want the truth and they want transparency. People want equitable experiences, not just compliance. People want brands to take a stand, not just play it safe. People want positive impact products and people want inclusion, not just to be included. And so with that, like I said at the beginning, there's this awesome ebook, some amazing folks um, here at Microsoft Advertising put this together. It's truly phenomenal. I definitely urge you to check that out. And with that, thank you all. And we'll, we'll turn to Q&A. Thank you. Virtual round of applause. <laughs> thank you so much, John. That was amazing. Um, so you. we have a few questions if, if you're cool with that. So we'll just yeah, we'll dive away. right in. So Eric starts us off with a great one. Eric Hins asks, what are your thoughts on overcoming or adapting to the digital divide where high-speed internet may not be available based on geography or socioeconomic status? Oh, goodness. Um, so, I mean, I think that there, there's a couple things in there. Um, one is, I mean, if you think about just, just advertising, search is going to work. Right? I mean, search has been functioning on mobile for quite a while now um it requires a relatively low bandwidth and so just if you if that is where your audience is and that's a concern right think about like placement right what am i doing with my various ad channels search is going to play well regardless i mean beyond that i mean i know I've, I've, I've heard people talk about well let's what are we doing in terms of like you know page load times and what is the the weight of all of the things on my website and how it's loading. And so AMP, I know is something that a lot of people have used. There's things, you know, discussions around, you know, responsive design, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't have a, an awesome answer. So my promise to you is to circle back with a more complete written answer. Awesome, thank you. I think your call out about like considering page speed as a factor is huge mm. as well. Um, our very own MSR, Michelle Stinson Ross asks, how does this apply to mental, emotional health awareness? Messaging and CTAs tend to trigger some level of stress. Yeah, the, the by now, right? Um, there's this, yeah, just the level of anxiety. So I've got to be perfectly honest. I personally have not thought about it from that perspective, but that rings a bell with me, right? I am somebody that, that again, being fully transparent, struggles with anxiety. And yeah, I don't, 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 don't pinch me. Don't force me, right? Like, give me my space. Let me have time. So, you know, this is me just answering off the cuff. I would say, you know, if that is something that you are fully aware of with your target audience, you know, be it, maybe it's a product that's catering to, to, to an audience that is known to have mental illness, whatever the case may be, consider doing some tests. Right, to say, okay, I've done the buy now thing. I've done the, you know, countdowns, right? You only have X number of hours left on this sale. I've done that. It looks like it worked. What if I try a different tactic? And that's something to prop up and test. Um, but no, MSR, you've got my wheels turning. Um, and yeah, I'm going to, that may end up being a blog post because that's fascinating to me. Awesome question, Michelle. Um, I actually had a question. So I was wondering, I wanted to get your thoughts. Is there a way, or I guess, how do you navigate still being inclusive while also incorporating your target audiences, like set beliefs or values? 
Um, I guess an example could be like your audience is known to be very religious, very spiritual. So maybe you want to incorporate like a tip to pray or something like that. Um, so how do you remain inclusive of people who aren't religious while still knowing that say a, a large portion of your audience does fit into that like spiritual religious realm? Fair enough. I mean, if there's a way to target elements of that, say with first party data, information that you already have, mm -hmm. remarketing, um, you know, you've built email lists and there's a certain segment of your audience that you know, hey, these, these are the folks that have already shown in that interest. They've shown that attribute that that message is going to resonate with them day in, day out. Like that's ideal, right? Because you can then isolate that for them and then everyone else maybe give just a more generic, whatever that may look like. And I apologize for loud vehicle sound. Um, but um, you no know, big picture is this. I would say it's uh, let the data ring true. So if you look at the sum of all of all of your potential customers, and if if the clear majority is somebody, if you mention prayer, you mention religion, and that's what's resonating, it's likely the direction you're going to move in with the brand. And as long as the brand values are in alignment with that, I would say that's going to click. And in fact, that may actually be the right thing to do because so many people avoid faith. They avoid religion and they say, I'm not going to touch this at all. And so I think it's, it's going to come out in the research you're doing and understanding your customers. But to, to the original question, and that is, can I be inclusive for all, but also speak this message to this audience? Take advantage of the tools that are available to you and like relying heavily on first party data because who knows how long remarketing will be with us. And that's a topic for another day. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, John. Do we have any other questions? Last call, y'all. I appreciate the y'all coming from this Kentucky boy. Yes, I've, uh, I'm doing a conscious effort to stop saying you guys, because I've been saying that forever. And y'all seems to be like the perfect kind of fix for that. And that yeah, is, I, I mean, and that touches on a big topic, right? Because then you're talking about in, other elements of inclusive language. That's yeah. one of the hardest habits I've, I've struggled with breaking myself. It is tough, the, yeah. The Scooby-Doo rules, which you can say, y'all gang folks, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, and zoinks. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Zoinks. <laughs> That's amazing. Do and they Scooby say snacks all those too, words? right? <laughs> Is Zoinks? Oh, goodness. Have you not watched Scooby Doo? That is one wait, wacky Wait a show. second. There needs to be a Jinkies in here somewhere. You're right. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> all right. I think, I think that's all our questions. John, thank you so much for being here. This has been such a pleasure. Jotted down a bunch of notes and going to get kicking, as you said, tomorrow. First thing awesome. at the desk. And if anybody has questions, I'm an open book. So Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever, come, come find me. And if I don't have the answer, I will go find one for you. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much, John. Again, huge round of virtual applause. And uh, yes, as John said, folks, uh, his information's right here. So if you have any follow-up questions and John, we'll be looking out for some of those uh, follow-up blog posts to, uh, That's right. to check out. Food for thought. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank we'll see you. you next time. Thanks, everyone. Take care.